What's up, everybody? This is Aaron from AaronsAudioCorner.com. I'm going to be reviewing the JTR Noesis 210 HT. Now, this is a 2022 model. I actually received this from Jeff at JTR back in October, I think. And man, I've been slacking. There were some questions about the measurements initially and I honestly just forgot about it once I got back from vacation. And then long story short, it took me a while to get back around to it and I just forgot. So here we are now, finally, I am reviewing and publishing the data for this review. This speaker is a behemoth. It is ridiculously huge. I, I didn't even bother trying to take it upstairs to my home theater room. When I demoed these, I actually brought them into my living room and set them up there. I just I just couldn't get them up the stairs by myself. When I demoed these, I was actually using a Parasound Hint 6, which has a, a it's adequate power for these speakers. And I was listening to them in my living room about four meters away. And at one point I was hitting 110 dB, not peaks, but just average output levels at four meters away for a stereo pair. That's ridiculous way louder than anybody ever needs to be listening. I was using the hearing protection just to, you know, cover my my ears, no pun intended. And uh, it's just wow. I guess that's really all I can say. But in terms of overall fidelity, you know, if you were trying to buy these and use them as a two-channel stereo system, then it's probably not the best way to go. And the reason for that is there's some linearity issues in the mid-range area. We'll talk about that shortly. And then the high frequency has a bit of a, a bump to it. On axis, it's fine. But in the room, when you combine it with the early reflections, what you get is an in-room response with a flat high frequency response, and it tends to sound bright. But I cannot imagine that anybody is using these for that particular situation because as far as I know, the people who are buying JTR speakers are buying them for home theater purposes. And when you're doing that, you're going to use equalization. So with equalization, these speakers are fan freaking tastic. You can equalize them pretty much to your heart's content because they have such great controlled directivity. And I'll talk about that as well in the data. So for now, I'm going to throw you this little bit of a B-roll while I roll through some of the basic specs that are on JTR's website. So here we go. It is a two-way design equipped with two 10-inch woofers and a sealed enclosure combined with an ultra-high-end compression driver fitted on a large wooden horn with a 60 by 60 degree coverage pattern. Horn loaded down to about 700 hertz, which is where the crossover is. Uh, it's really heavy. It's braced really well. It does come with grills, but I didn't use them. And the terminals on the back are ridiculously huge. And if you're wondering, yeah, my neighbor saw that. Actually, the one across the street even waved to me when he kind of shook his head. So whatever. Um, let's go ahead and start rolling through some of the data and I'll kind of explain where in the data explains what I heard when I was doing my listening tests. First of all, I want to mention the impedance. It does dip down to about a minimum of three ohm in the 100 to 200 hertz region. You will want a separate power amplifier for this speaker, even though it has relatively high sensitivity, you're going to not want to push these on an AVR would be my personal suggestion. Now we are at the CEA 2034 measurements, and this is all done via the Klippel Near Field Scanner, which is a state-of-the-art measurement device that allows you to get anechoic data in a non-anechoic environment, such as my garage. And the reason that you want to do this is because you want to separate the room from the speaker. That way I can predict better how a speaker is going to sound to you in your given room. And it works fantastically above about 500 Hertz, which is typically where room modes start taking over on the low end. The prediction is within a few DB almost every single time. If I'm measuring in my room, in my living room, in my home theater, two separate rooms, or comparing it to measurements taken in other people's rooms, the moving mic measurements. So it's, it's very, very good at predicting what you're going to hear. And that's why it's so important to use objective data to quantify the performance of a speaker. As you can see here, you're looking at an average sensitivity of about 92.5 dB. And then we can see a roll off in the sealed enclosure of about 12 dB per octave. 
F3 is at 76 hertz, F10 is at 43 hertz, which means that yes, you will want to use a subwoofer. I imagine most people are probably going to be using 15s or 18s so based on the installs that I've seen out on AVS forum and other Facebook groups. Right here, we have two pretty troublesome resonances, if I'm being honest, just as a data junkie. And when I listen to these speakers, the one around the 600 hertz area, 6, 700 hertz area was the one that stood out to me audibly. Uh, it tended to sound a little bit muddy. And then when I performed the measurements and I, I, I compared my notes, my listening notes to my measurements, I think I understood why. So what I did was I took my mini DSP DDRC88A, I applied a single band of EQ, a parametric band, right at that frequency, dropped that down about 2 dB, and that really seemed to clear things up, at least it seemed like it did. I also played around with the high frequency, and you may be wondering why, because this on-axis response looks really good. But the problem is that once you get it into a room, this is the predicted response. And if you draw a trend line, you can see that there's about a three to five dB treble lift. And that's why this speaker sounded bright to me in my room. The cool thing about this speaker though, is that it takes well to EQ. I've got a separate video that is geared more toward the topic of two channel listening versus home theater listening and the design aspects that you wanna look for. I'll throw that up here in the card. Make sure you go watch that because I explain a little bit more in detail what I'm about to say, which is when you have a smooth early reflections directivity index, that means that the speaker will respond well to equalization. And with this almost flat line, I mean, it's almost really flat above about 1.2 kilohertz or so, that means that I can do whatever I want to the response and it's gonna behave off axis in the same manner, as opposed to me equalizing the response on axis and then also disproportionately affecting the off axis response. And when that happens, you have two different sounds coming at you from the direct sound and the reflected sound. And that really messes with the timbre of things. This speaker won't have that issue. It does respond well to EQ, not only just based on the data, but I'll also prove that out in my listening test response fine. And once I added EQ to the speaker, it really took it to the next level. So if you're using something like Dirac or Mini DSP, which is what I use for the manual EQ, uh, you can also use Odyssey, any of those kind of based on the AVR. Those should probably remedy things that you would like to fix if you're into that. Now, that said, you may find that the speaker sounds good to you out of the box. I would suggest playing around with toe in because initially I had the speakers set up directly on axis. That's when I used EQ. But when I started playing around with the toe in and I actually towed them out, faced them straight out into the room, that actually helped things out. And usually when you do that, you affect soundstage width for the better, but you also lose some imaging focus. And the reason for that generally is that you have more energy spread to the walls, but these speakers have a pretty narrow radiation pattern of about plus or minus 30 degrees horizontally, even vertically as well. And because of that, there's not so much energy being sent to the side walls, even when the speakers are facing forward out into the room. And since you are most likely gonna be using equalization with the speaker, I'm gonna focus on that aspect rather than talking about the on-axis and off-axis performance. I'm gonna talk about the off-axis performance with respect to the on-axis performance, and we'll talk about what that means as far as equalization goes. This is the horizontal beam width of the speaker, and the dark red indicates the higher area of energy. And generally what you would like to see is you would like to see a uniform uh, control pattern. However, the narrow radiation pattern or the wide radiation pattern, that's something that is up to you, the end user, and really kind of depends on what you like. Personally speaking, I like a wider radiation pattern, but a speaker like this may perform well for you and it may work out better for what your needs are. As I said, when you turn the speaker out into the room, you catch more sidewall reflections, generally speaking, but that's not so much the case with this particular speaker. And the reason for that is, as I said, you've got a horizontal beam width of about plus or minus 30 degrees. And I'm basing that on the negative 6 dB value, which is about half as loud. Going vertically, you have the same kind of deal. You have a narrowing up of the radiation pattern through the mid-range, and it gets a little bit broader through here. Make sure you're sitting within a few degrees of the tweeter cone vertically. If you want to tow them on and off axis horizontally, that's fine. But again, I would recommend that you sit within the window of the tweeter as best you can. And for what it's worth, I'm saying tweeter, I do mean compression driver. 
it's interchangeable for what I'm talking about. Now let's talk about the distortion specs. This is an 86 dB, 3% distortion. The speaker never even touches it. Now we'll go to 96 dB. It still never touches 3% distortion. Now you do see it climb up around this area. And my guess is that this is probably a combination of maybe some woofer breakup and most likely just the low end of the compression driver itself. But without actually having raw driver measurements, I can't say that for sure. It's just an educated guess at this point. I didn't have any issues with distortion with this speaker because it was playing so darn loud before the distortion would have risen to a point where it might have mattered. I'd have been going deaf anyway. Talk about compression. We can see that the compression for this speaker is really good, except for around the 800 to 1 kilohertz region. There's some things going on there that, you know, is not that great, but still with that said, it's, it's really not that high. If I'm being completely honest, I don't like seeing it, but I can't tell you that it's going to be an issue. We're talking 102 dB levels here where it hits about three quarter dB. And that's for one speaker at one meter. So a pair of speakers at about four meters is going to be about 92 dB where that purple line is. I don't know that you're going to notice it, but again, it's something in the data that I like to compare against other speakers. And that's it for the data aspect. I will have all of my data and more on my website. I'll have the link in the description below. To wrap up my thoughts on this speaker, number one, it gets dumb loud. Anybody who has a home theater that's looking for loud output, look at this speaker. It's ridiculous. Um, the linearity out of the box is not so great on the mid-range area. The treble is nice as far as the on-axis response goes, but in the room, that's problematic to my ears. I would recommend using EQ and resolving a lot of the issues. I mean, it's it's little work. It's like three bands of EQ. It's two around the mid-range and then one shell filter on the high frequency and you clean the speaker right up. And, and matter of fact, I even considered doing that and then re-measuring the speaker with equalization. But given that it's almost 90 pounds, there was no way that I was gonna be able to lift it back on my clipple to measure it all again. And it took about 12 hours because I, I had to do 3,800 measurement points to get the error down low enough in the high frequency to where it actually matched the quasi anechoic far field measurement. So I just, I didn't want to do it again, even though I did. Great imaging and focus that does take a hit on the width, I think. But as I said, you can turn the speakers a little bit off axis, toe them out, face them out into the room. You can gain a little bit more width and it really doesn't hurt the imaging and focus. That's going to be it for this review. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. If I missed anything, Ask me, I'll try my best to cover it in the comments. Again, check my website because there's a lot more data there. If you like the video, please leave me a thumbs up. If you didn't like it, okay. Please subscribe if you haven't already and hit the notifications bell to be alerted for future videos when they are released. And that's it, okay. All right, y'all take care, have a good one, peace.